Okay, Buzz of YouTube. What's up, all you UCL fans out there? How's it going, guys? This is going to be the week four power rankings for UCL season three. Hopefully, you guys do enjoy. And if you do, make sure to hammer arm that thumbs up button down below. As always, let me know in the comment section below what was your favorite match of this week or what is your own ranking for week number four. So, for me personally, my favorite match I think was Nick versus Shady. Uh, mainly just because of the surprise factor in that match and I don't want to spoil it it's just it was a crazy battle definitely go check it out uh, as you can see from the timestamp on on the both sides it wasn't that long of a match but it was just it did not go anything at all like how I had expected and it was it was really really interesting honestly so definitely go check that out but yeah uh one last thing before we do actually get started with this uh, for those of you who may have missed it last week i did upload a video where i talked about uh top draft league pokemon in uh the draft league format if that's a video you guys may be interested in seeing if you're new to the format or if maybe you want to learn more about the draft league format then definitely go check out that video i talk about uh some of the best or the best mons uh in general in the draft league format so if you guys want to go check that out if it interests you then definitely go peep that it would be uh, greatly appreciated but enough of that little plug let's go ahead and i guess get this started i don't really have too much to say thank you for the support guys on the first three power rankings hopefully uh y'all continue to enjoy these and yeah we can get this started so starting off at number eight here we have good old jyt gamer mr coach of the carolina keldios i did not make sense at all but yeah we have jay here at number eight also thank you for those of you guys that leave that did leave comments saying uh you like the way that the new rankings are and you like the new visuals i was finally able to get like the actual size logos and i will be doing these uh from here on out for the remainder of the power rankings also shouts out to people who did give me suggestions on uh, how to improve these videos as well so yeah at number eight we have here jay a uh, youtube gamer unfortunately jay takes another loss but i do like the fact that in this match i i really feel like jay played this match uh better than he did his first three weeks and what i mean by that is that he he never really like doubted any plays that he made uh, i think there was only like one or two real like kind of 50 50 plays that maybe if he had got correctly honestly might have been able to shift momentum a little bit into his favor but i think for the most part in this week jay really showed that uh if you like can just focus properly and he can just sit down and like actually try to have a game plan and try to think things out a little bit more that he could uh, definitely come back and, and win a match very easily i like his prep as well i like the banded pangoro banded pangoro oh my arceus that thing hit ridiculously hard it did so much damage to swampert and it did like 45 percent to a i believe spadef bulky clefable which was absolutely insane like the fact that pangoro does that much damage to a pokemon in its own right in clefable what they resisted hit is just is disgusting honestly uh clefable was able to beat it 1v1 though but just the fact that knockoff did that much damage is absolutely absurd honestly that's that's just it's really wild in my opinion but uh yeah he had the the memento whimsicott for the belly drum slurpuff which i thought was really really smart i thought that was a really good bring on uh jay's part for prep unfortunately though i feel like he just kind of jumped the gun with the memento on the whimsicott because nappy still had uh most of his team uh, very very healthy in the back he also still had jirachi in the back he did mention in his commentary that even if jirachi was scarfed it still outsped slurpuff after a belly drum and because i do believe nappy had scarf flygon i think scarf flygon might have been able to outspeed the the slurpuff as well after the belly drum so i feel like he he had his game plan down i don't know if he had parting shot or not on the pangoro i don't remember but if he did have the parting shot on pangoro along with the memento on the whimsicott he did try to formulate a nice game plan to hopefully allow slurpuff to come in and uh, sweep late game unfortunately though he didn't really properly use it and he used it kind of like mid game and then the rest of the end game just kind of went a little bit downhill from there on out although i did feel like he was going to win the match at the end uh, when it was beedrill against flygon and appy stayed in to go for dragon claw as uh, Jay brought in the Cresselia. I really thought that Cresselia might have been able to pick up a KO there against something. And if he had been aggressive with something like the Signal Beam 
or if he just had like Thunder Wave on Cresselia, that would have been a uh, tremendous because that would have been able to stop the Hoopa Unbound, which uh, otherwise just kind of ran through Jay's squad for the most part. I definitely feel like Jay played a lot better this week, and that's not to say that Nappy uh, played bad or anything. I think Nappy played pretty solid as well, but I think Jay definitely played a lot better this week than he did any of his uh, previous three weeks, and who knows, maybe he'll be able to eventually kind of bounce back next week and uh, get the swing of things again. So moving on to our rank number seven squad here, we have Mr. Shady Penguin and his uh, New York Mankeys. Now, Shady unfortunately just kind of drops again this week, but the main thing that I liked uh, that Shady did in this match, if anything, was that he didn't—he didn't really give up. He—he he didn't um, just kind of start sacking his team to start sacking his team. And I was reading some of his comments, and uh, some people said, "Well, uh, you should learn to not give up. You should learn to still keep your head in the game," and just kind of comments like that. But honestly, watching the match, I felt like Shady didn't necessarily give up at all. This week, he put more thought into what he wanted to do and he didn't immediately just kind of uh, throw in the towel this time around as where last week he misclicked and he was like oh I lost so he sacked off like half of his team and then eventually ended up losing because of that but this time around he lost mainly because he was caught off guard and I don't want to blame that on Shady's prep uh, I feel like his prep was decent enough but this is where when you get into the very nitty gritty of things, when you get into those obscure sets that you think may come and they don't come, or if you don't try to think that far ahead, this is where you're going to get really caught off guard. This is where things are going to kind of really mess you up. And that's why I really feel like even though Shady's prep was probably not the best it could have been, it was solid enough, and he did unfortunately get tossed, uh, for lack of a better term, I still feel like he did, uh, he was more confident this time around, he didn't lose hope, he was still trying to keep his head in the game, and try to find some way to play around the Celesteela after it had boosted to plus two speed, then I got the weakness policy, he tried to switch around to get the intimidate drops, but ultimately that was not going to end up working out at all, because Celesteela would just continue boosting its attack after it got a KO, and at plus two there was not really much that Shady could have done to stop Celesteela at that point, and there was no real way for Shady to have been able to tell if he was facing a weakness policy Celesteela so I don't think that he played around the Celesteela bad at all I feel like maybe he could have tried to scout out a little bit better but that's still arguable because again there was no real way that Shady was going to be able to tell it was weakness policy plus autonomize and uh, unfortunately when he found out what it was it was a little bit too late uh, but for the most part I, I don't think Shady played this match bad at all so moving on to uh, number six here, we have Mr. Twit Twit. Hi, I am Twit, that cool new kid who used to be that dude with the fro though, and his Grand Canyon Greninjas. I believe Twit does actually move up one spot here, uh, just because I definitely feel like he played this match better than Shady played his match uh, to an extent. Plus, the outcome was not as one-sided as um, as Shady's uh, match. And the main thing about Twit in this game was that he made really good use of his team without having Kieran Black. Now, I mean, I can kind of see why he wouldn't want to bring Kieran Black to this matchup because Nexus did have things like the Lopunny, the Coco, the Victini, uh, even Zydog and uh, Nihiligo. Uh, all of those mons outsped the Kieran Black and were able to deal with it with some type of stab move or just super effective move in general so it makes sense why Twit didn't want to bring the Kieran Black to this matchup although I still think it might have been pretty useful to him like Kieran Black in general uh, is just something you can hit things uh, really hard with but he was able to make his team around to where it didn't really hurt him too badly that he didn't have it but I feel like another thing that Twit I think kind of uh, has yet to realize, or I don't, I want to say yet to realize, but maybe yet to put into effect is the fact that he has so many like useful support options on his team that he has yet to bring. He has some scary offensive threats as well that he has yet to bring. Things like Tailwind Tornadus uh, is really good with Kieran Black. Uh, I don't think he's brought Sticky Webs yet either. And they might have been able to help him in this matchup. Like, Kieran Black and Tailwind would have been absolutely terrifying 
for the team that Nexus had brought. Uh, if he had Sticky Webs, everything except Scarf Victini, I think, would have been outsped by Kieran Black, which uh, would have been very, very huge as well. At the same time, though, you do have to think about the prep where uh, Tapu Koko gets defog, Savali Steel gets defog, and Serena does also get Rabbit Spin. So I can kind of see why he didn't want to try and rely on Sticky Webs. And Tailwind only really lasts for like two turns, essentially, because I think the turn that you get it up also counts as one of your three turns, which is a little bit dumb if you really think about it. But even then, like, it might have been pretty cool to see, and it might have been able to help him out. Uh, otherwise, though, I think that he he really did play this match well. He did the early game pretty solid. He was able to make a really nice double from Scizor into Infernape. Now, I don't remember if he... I'm guessing he didn't have U-Turn on Scizor, because if he did have U-Turn, then there was really no reason for him to have doubled into Infernape. Z Haze Tapu Fini was pretty smart. I did like that bring. He did play around the Snorlax very accordingly, but at the same time, I kind of feel like Nexus played very, very badly with the Snorlax. But that's not to take anything from Twit because Twit played how he should have played around the Snorlax. He played well around it. He was able to stop it from boosting too much. He eventually was able to knock off the 50% uh, berry, which was the Ayapapa berry. Then the way he pronounced it was a little bit annoying, but it's fine. Uh, it was the Ayapapa berry, and he was able to get rid of that, so Snorlax wasn't as big of an issue. Although I guess Snorlax still ended up doing some decent work to his team. Unfortunately, though, one thing I've really, really started to notice about Twit is that while he can play the the early game and the mid game decently well or well enough, it's the end game that really kind of catches up with Twit because he kind of tends to put himself in non-favorable positions, and I feel like that's where Twit kind of kind of like falls off a bit where he kind of starts to tilt down and uh, things go downhill for him because for example in this match he had to uh, lock himself into a move with his Infernape which was his last Mon. Uh, because it was Scarfed Infernape he was forced to lock himself into either Earthquake where I believe Nexus still had Yuxi in the back or if he not if he locked himself into the Flare Blitz he still had Victini as well. So there was just no real good move that Twig could have done at that point in the match where he would have been able to still win. Also, the Celebi, uh, I feel like he, uh, not Celebi, sorry, Palosan, I feel like he ended up sacking Palosan a little bit too early. Like, I don't think Rock should have been uh, that uh, prioritized, if you get what I'm trying to say, because as soon as Palosan dropped, that just opened up the gate for Tapu Koko to come in and literally just Thunderbolt and U-Turn for free. But between Victini, Lopani, and Tapu Koko, those three alone would have been able to pressure the Celebi. And I really feel like he should have tried to keep Palosand around and tried to keep it a little bit healthier to kind of at least deal with the Tapu Koko a little better. And even maybe try to tank a hit from Victini as well. Otherwise, Twit didn't do that bad this week. I still feel like he kind of needs to try to get a better handling of his end game uh, plan essentially and then if he can figure that out he should be good for the rest of the season here so moving on to number five we have PK coach of the Philadelphia for alligators PK you are loud okay you are you are really really loud I was watching the battle eating my food next thing this dude started blurting I was like, like good lord my man, it's, it's, it's calm down. You gotta, you gotta chill out. You're gonna get a noise complaint eventually. No, <laughs> so, obviously I don't mean that in a bad way. But yeah, uh, PK, this was not a really good showing for PK. I f see this is like the complete opposite of Jay, which is actually kind of funny because their drafts are, are are already like parallel of each other. But this match was the complete opposite of of like how Jay's been doing. Jay's been playing kind of poorly his first three weeks, did really good week four, as where PK has been playing his first three weeks very well, and then this week he just kind of did not really do that well. Uh, first off, the very beginning of the battle, Reggie Steel not being able to do anything to the Tapu Koko was really, really bad for PK. He did say he did not expect uh, the substitute Kartana, which, I mean, the surprise factor is the whole point for the set. And uh, it really did end up catching him off guard. I also don't think he had any type of move on Reggie Steel to even hit Kartana, which is another just really 
bad, bad thing. Because realistically, Cartana cannot break through Registeel. The only way Cartana can break through Registeel is if it Sword Zances and has the Sacred Sword. So if he had been able to put like HP Fire or just Fire Punch on Registeel, he would have been able to deal with the Cartana set that Mo had brought, and then that would have ensured that he didn't need to lose his Manetric like turn two. The fact that Mega Manetric went down so early opened up so much for Mo to be able to do in the match. That got rid of PK's momentum, one of PK's hard hitting mons, one of PK's most speedy mons, and one of his main answers to Milotic, which Milotic at that point, if he did not have offensive Rotom Wash, PK wouldn't have been able to uh, potentially break through the Milotic. And then at that point, Milotic could have just won the match for him just in general. So it just, it was really bad that he lost the Manetric so early. And then behind a sub, Cartana got a plus one in its in its physical attack. It's a plus one with Life Orb. That is doing tremendous damage to anything. And again, he didn't end up bringing in the uh, Registeel because he probably was still fearing the fact that if he did have the Sacred Sword, then it obviously would have been able to do a lot of damage to uh, PK's Registeel there. And at that point, it's at plus one and behind a sub. So it's understandable as to why he decided to bring in the uh, Landorus before the Registeel, just on the off chance that Mo did have the Sacred Sword. And then that way, um, at least Landorus could try to break the sub so PK could have some way of uh, trying to revenge kill the Kartana. But unfortunately, because of the static that uh, Manetric did get on Kartana, uh, Landorus was able to get off a huge chunk on the Kartana before it went down to a Leaf Blade, uh, second Leaf Blade. Now, I'm not sure how much that paralysis would have mattered. I feel like if the Kartana didn't get paralyzed, Mo would have been able to keep the Kartana for later in the match, potentially to try and have it around to beat the Rotom Wash. And unfortunately, because of the paralysis, he was forced to sack it off. And then that meant he lost one of his answers to Rotom Wash. And speaking of Rotom Wash, PK did get very unlucky with not being able to hit a second Hydro Pump on the Dom Fan. He got hit by the C-Bomb. And, and then at that point, the match was pretty much over. Like, there, he had no way of dealing with Milotic. There was a little bit of a stall fest between Registeel and Milotic, which of course Milotic was going to win at 10 out of 10 times. And then I believe once the Registeel went down, Rotom was super weak. He had already lost the Manetric and the Landris. Scarf Delphox was not going to be able to do much at all. And even the Terrakion, which I think was his last Mon, uh, wouldn't have been able to do anything either. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, just kind of a bit of a hack scene match. I'm not sure how much really i feel like the paralysis on cartana and then the hydro pump miss kind of evened themselves out because it was kind of 50 50 because the paralysis ensured that the main answer for rotom wash that mo had was gone and the hydro pump miss was able to let dawn fan get off a huge hit on rotom and uh, make it easier for mo to deal with so maybe you guys, I hope you guys kind of get what I'm trying to say by that. But I mean, hacks is part of the game. Uh, you have to try and play around it and hope that it doesn't hinder you uh, that badly. But I will give props to PK. He did stay confident throughout the match. He still tried to develop a game plan. And I definitely won't, I definitely believe PK will bounce back next week. So moving on to our rank number four member here. We have Nappy Boy 92 the King Nappy, coach of the Tukasan Tarakions. And uh, he moved up from number five, I believe to number four this time around and actually i want to say one quick thing here i saw somebody comment saying that uh i was being biased towards the people that i helped prep when that's not really true at all because if they lose their match i'm obviously not gonna keep them at like whatever original rank i have them if they lose they're probably gonna move down regardless so i don't I don't understand how how that's me being biased when I'm trying to rank them as they perform in the battle. So yeah, I, I really do not try to be biased on these power rankings. So I hope you guys don't think that. But just yeah, I just, I just want to say that. But we have Nappy here at number four. 
uh, he did take on Jay, uh, which he was able to pull out a victory here. Uh, this match went a lot better than his match last week against Nick. Last week against Nick, it was very obvious that uh, Nappy was kind of over predicting a lot. He was mispredicting. He was overthinking as always. He did kind of overthink a little bit in this match against Jay, but for the most part, it wasn't really uh, all that bad, honestly. And uh, for once, he didn't play Swampert poorly. <laughs> Uh, this time around, even though, yes, he did lose Swampert kind of early in the match, uh, Swampert still did a pretty good amount in the match. It was able to get a Brox, it was able to Toxic and just severely weaken the uh, Swampert, I mean the Garchomp, sorry, and it, he should have been able to tell that Pangora was banded off of the Swampert, but he didn't realize it was banded until the knockoff hit Clefable. But regardless, Swampert uh, wasn't necessarily the most important thing for Nappy uh, this uh, time around in this week's match. I do want to give him huge, huge props though to finally playing Hoopa aggressively. He was way more aggressive with Hoopa this time around and it was really able to show. I believe he did end up getting two KOs with it if I'm not mistaken, which is really nice because Hoopa is a mon that is not really going to sweep on its own. It's going to come in, take one, two, and hopefully three Pokemon down with it and then it just opens up holes for the rest of your team to come in and take advantage of he did make a very smart play as well against the pangoro because he signal beamed as jay switched in pangoro and the fact that he was able to stay in on the pang i mean the fact that he switched out against pangoro sorry was a really good play on nappy's part because if that had been scarf pangoro and he did um stay in with hoopa and he got revenge killed by pangoro then that would have been really bad because then at that point in the match uh, Cresselia would have been an absolute nightmare for him to try and deal with so it was a really good call that he did decide to switch out the Hoopa there I think that was definitely one of his uh, smart smarter plays that he made throughout the match uh, the Jirachi being kept in the back for the Slurpuff was really good although again I do feel like Jay kind of jumped the gun a little bit on the Slurpuff and then near the end of the match I really thought he was going to lose uh, just because with Flygon against the Beedrill it was, I guess, a little bit of a 50-50, but at the same time, if Nappy had gone for the U-turn instead of going for Dragon Claw and Jay did stay in, that probably would have hurt Nappy more than it would have benefited him, I think, honestly. So I feel like him going straight for the Dragon Claw wasn't necessarily that bad, but if Jay did have something like Thunder Wave on the Cresselia and he was able to catch the Hoopa, then that might have been a little bit bad for Nappy. But for the most part, he did play this match a lot better than he played last week. He kept his cool, he didn't over predict as badly, and he was able to uh, put in a good amount of work with his Mons. Moving on to our rank number three squad here, we have the Hidden Mo and the Toronto Togekiss. Even though it kind of looks like Mo, I guess, was penalized this week by dropping one spot, it was just, it was mainly down to the fact that the squad above him, the team above him, just played their match much better and uh, the prep they had was much better. That, that's really all it came down to. Otherwise, Mo still easily played his match against PK very solidly. Although I do feel like it was a little bit risky for him to have gone straight for a substitute with Kartana because Registeel could have potentially had the HP Fire or the Fire Punch. Although the Hydro Pump miss against the Domfan did kind of help out Mo. But as I mentioned when I talked about PK, it kind of went hand in hand with the Kartana being paralyzed off of the static from the Manetric because if Kartana had not been paralyzed he would have been able to beat Landers without having to take the Earthquake damage and then Mo would have been able to keep the Kartana in the back to pressure the Rotom Wash uh, forcing it to switch out which means he was able to get off damage on the rest of PK's team and he still would have had Kartana as a threat lying in wait. So I still really feel like the Hydro Pump and the Static honestly were 50-50 and they evened themselves out. Yeah, I guess PK did miss a Stone Edge like last turn of the match but at that point it didn't really matter because uh, Mo still had the battle won basically. So yeah, outside of that like there was no real real bad hacks 
or hacks that uh, ultimately would have affected too much in the actual match itself. Uh, he did, like I said, he played the match solidly. He didn't really misplay too much. He handled basically everything that PK had pretty well. Uh, the Landorus went down very early. Manetric went down very early. He was able to severely weaken the Rotom Wash, which Rotom Wash was going to be the most annoying thing for him to try and deal with. The Scarf Delphox unfortunately just became set up fodder for Dragon Dance Charizard X, which was ultimately able to win the match because it did dodge a Stone Edge, which again, I don't think necessarily mattered too much in uh, the long run of the battle. So yeah, not really too much to say about Mo, but he did what he had to do and he was able to pull out the victory. So moving on to our rank number two team. Now this is where I'm like, oh, well, this could have been, he could have been rank number three and then that way Mo wouldn't have dropped. But then if I put him rank number three, somebody would have been like, well, why isn't he number two or arguably number one? So at number two, we have uh, Sacred Fire Nicholas and his Chicago Bufalons. And again, this is why I like to hear your guys' own power rankings. I like to see where you guys have them ranked. So yeah, we have Nick here at number two and boy, oh my Arceus, boy, oh boy, ladies and gentlemen, this game, this was wild. Nick played his team to a T. He played it perfect. And it's just, it's crazy. I did not expect him to just wash Shady like he did. The prep that Nick had was just so, so good. The fact that he was able to bring in Celestila, autonomize, and be able to realize that the best way that Shady has to beat Celesteela is to hit it with multiple super effective moves. And that's where the problem arose for Shady. The fact that he, there was no way he could just straight Oko Celesteela and then Nick was able to bring it in, get the autonomize up, get hit by that Thunderbolt and it was <laughs> GG boys. It was over. Everything went downhill for Shady. Nick played his Alolan Muck uh, much better as well, ensuring that he didn't lose or that he didn't forget to recycle. But in the end, it was just Celesteela coming in, getting the plus two speed, then the weakness policy activated, and it was GG. <laughs> GG, boys, it was over. It's GG, it's Nick. There's really nothing I can say about this match, guys. Like I literally just explained the entire battle to you. I mean, the only real thing that I guess Nick played poorly or did poorly against was the fact that he went straight for a bulldoze on the heatran when shady had a mega latios in the back but in the grand scheme of things it literally does not matter <laughs> like it literally doesn't matter that he made like that one misplay because everything else was just basically in the match was like 98 percent nick two percent shady yeah moving on to our rank number one team here we have of course mr num Belizes, num nexus the azumarill incarnation himself num nexus and his pittsburgh pichus now uh nexus this time around did a pretty decent job in his match against twit the only thing i don't like that nexus did in this game was how badly just how horrendous he played Snorlax. He jumped the gun way, way too early with Snorlax. I don't care if he did know Infernape was choice. The fact that Twit still had a Tapu Fini in the back, a potential trick Celebi as well, is just, I don't, I really don't agree with how he played his his Snorlax this match. Outside of that, I don't really think I have anything uh, questionable I think he did in this match. Well, actually, him going uh, straight for a return with Low Pony was also a little bit questionable. Uh, just because I think he honestly should have just gone straight for a high jump kick. Uh, regardless of even if Twit had switched in to Tapu Fini or to the Celebi, they're still going to be taking a good chunk of damage from high jump kick. And if he was able to weaken Celebi, that just opened up the gate for Tapu Koko to be an even bigger issue for Twit to deal with. If he was able to hit the Tapu Fini on the switching, it would have been a lot easier for him to be able to uh, be able to beat it because a high jump kick still would have done a decent chunk to the Tapu Fini. And since he didn't have leftovers, he was Z Hayes. Once he forced that C Hayes sooner, he then could have 
still uh, been able to wear it down a lot easier as well. I guess in the end, it really didn't matter that much, but I don't think he should have gone straight for a return with the low punny. I really like the fact that Silvali Steel put in a decent amount of work in this match. It was such a ballsy, ballsy play for him to leave in Silvali on the Inferni, but ultimately it did end up helping him out. And Silvali Steel already just shining week one, and I can only imagine just how better Nexus might have been able to do for his first three games if he initially had Silvali Steel instead of Steelix. And this is a matchup where Steelix wouldn't have come at all, but it was a matchup where Silvali Steel did have a decent enough presence to be brought. And I was really happy that he was able to use um, Silvali Steel uh, decently well, and it did put in a bit of work. As always, Yuxi, just an absolute fat, bulky mon that uh, his opponents seem to have a hard time trying to break through. There was not really anything I think that Nexus really struggled with in this game. I feel like he more or so was kind of doubting himself and being, um, I don't want to say negative, but not like as positive as he should have been trying to be, just because he didn't really have anything to worry about against uh, Twit in general. So yeah, I definitely feel like this win on Nexus's end was very solid. Uh, I don't think he really made two misplays outside of just really not playing the Snorlax well, which again didn't ultimately matter uh, too much in the long run of the battle here. And the fact that Twit did not have Karen Black uh, allowed Nexus to play a little bit more risky and play more aggressive and uh, ultimately end up winning the match. But yeah guys, that is going to be our power rankings for week number four. Let me know what your favorite match of this week was in the comment section below. Let me know what your own power rankings are as well. And make sure to hammer arm that thumbs up button down below. With that being said, I will see you all next week. Also, I did make a video recapping all the trades that the coaches did make. And I gave my thoughts and opinions on those. So if you guys want to go check that video out, along with my video on the top draft league Pokemon and Ultra Sun and Moon, then uh, feel free to check out those two videos, which will be at the end of this one. So with that being said, Thank you all for watching. Later, everybody. No matter where you're at, I'm not here to make friends. It's time to attack and deplete your HP with a final smash. Don't make me turn around and pull a six foot hacks. <laughs> six foot, six foot hacks, hacks. Yeah. Six foot, six foot hacks, hacks. Yeah. Six foot, six foot hacks, hacks.